The scripture reading this morning will come from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I'll tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Thank you, Bob. It's a great day to be able to be here and to sing praises. Thank you, Steve, for uh, leading us in those songs. And uh, isn't it great just to be able to sing praises to God? And there's a hope, a very small hope, that things are going to cool off here. <laughs> it's getting there, but it's, uh, it's kind of slow coming. I know how that is. Um, if you're one of those who signed up to go deliver pizzas today with Joshua, make sure that uh, you're over there in the fellowship hall and able to meet with him and do that. Also, if you're part of the Mo Connect group, tonight it's going to be at our house. Did you get that, Rebecca? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Today we're going to be talking about failure. It's a very easy topic for me. Lots of things to pull from, and when you start looking around, it's, it's pretty common to most of us. I found this. It says, during 1978, the firemen strike in England, the British Army took over emergency firefighting. On January 14th, they were called out by an elderly lady in South London to retrieve her cat. They arrived with impressive haste very cleverly and carefully rescued the cat and started to drive away. But the lady was so grateful, she invited the squad of heroes in for tea. And driving off later with fond farewells and waving arms, they ran over the cat. <laughs> yeah, everything doesn't work out well, does it? Some things are just failure to begin with. Um, but failure is always an event. Failure is never a person. And so I want to make sure that you know that. It is never who you are. It is something that happens around you. And so make sure that you don't ever see yourself as being the failure. But things do happen. The Bible talks a lot about people who fail. In fact, did you know that every single person except one in the Bible fails? And almost all the stories that we have are not really success stories. They're stories about things that took great faith through a failure that was happening at the time to do something great for God. But it's always through a difficulty. It's always through something hard. And it's never just something that's very, very simple. In fact, here this morning, I'd venture to say every single person here today has had some kind of failure in your life, some kind of thing that does not go well. And if you've never failed at anything, you're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen. So the situation with Peter that we see, Jesus is there, it's the last night, he's trying to tell them about what's going to happen, and he says, you know, Peter, you're going to deny that you even know me. Well, Peter is one of those people who's very dedicated. He's very much wanting to serve God. And, and so he has this intensity about him. No, I would never do that. That will never happen. And we get that way when we have this great faith. And we believe that we are so strong at the time. We believe that it's going to be that we will always be true and be faithful to God. We can't imagine not being faithful to God. My real question is why, if Jesus knows this is going to happen, why doesn't he stop it? Why doesn't he not permit him? Why doesn't he do something about it? I mean, I guess he tells him about it. That is doing something. And the truth is, that's probably all we can do. Is maybe let somebody know, you know what, I see this coming. But Jesus lets it happen. 
And I'm not sure we are ever able to stop things from happening. Peter's convinced it won't happen. But Jesus understands. And he says, this is something we can use. There's four statements that are made in this passage that I want you to be aware of. As you look at this as Jesus' view of failure, one of the things that maybe is the most scary of all is Satan demanded. I don't like it when Satan demanded. What do you mean Satan demanded? This is Jesus saying, you know what, Satan demanded. Well, how much demand did Satan make? How much did Satan want? And Satan wanted, this is pretty extreme, isn't it? You know what flowers like when you sift flour? It goes through the little tiny grate because the thing spins around and, okay, I have to help cook. <laughs> and it forces it through all this little mesh. Satan wanted to do that to you. He wanted to sift you like wheat. He wanted to control you. He wanted to make sure that your life was going to be as miserable as possible. But the second phrase is Jesus prayed. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? And so Jesus prayed. What did Jesus pray? That it won't happen? No. Not at all. Jesus knows it's going to happen and he doesn't say it can never happen. He recognizes that's who Peter is. He recognizes that's going to happen. And so... Jesus prays. He prays that faith doesn't fail. Isn't that an odd thing to pray about? I mean, to me, I'd pray that it doesn't happen. Don't let it. But that's not Jesus' prayer for Peter. It's that your faith won't fail. Because we're going to use this, remember? Failure is not something that happens in an isolated place that you try to get away from. Failure is something you use over and over again. The reason why the Bible talks about people who have failures is because it is something they use. So we've been talking about seeking Jesus and finding Jesus. I want you to realize that we find Jesus in our failure. And he prays that his faith will not fail. Have you ever been there before? Where you think you're following Jesus, you're dedicated. You said you were going to go even to death with him. Prison and death. And sure enough, you don't make it through the night. And so here he is. Prison and death. It, it, it was just kind of a surprise. It wasn't something he was expecting. It, it wasn't stated like it was supposed to be stated. It was, you know, if you just asked me point blank, are you going to deny Jesus? I would have said no. But that isn't what happens. It's just kind of a mention. Oh, do you know him? Aren't you one of them? No, I don't know him. Well, I'm not denying Jesus. I'm just saying to that person, I don't know him. No, it's the same thing. Sometimes we can believe against all logic and all ridicule. We believe beyond popular opinion and still, we fail. Faith is bigger than our own denial. Faith is bigger than our fears. And then Jesus gives him something to do. When you turn again, strengthen others. Strengthen your brother. When you turn again, not if you turn again. It isn't a matter of you not going down that road of failure, but I want you to realize when you do fail, then there's a purpose for this and a reason for this so that you will understand other people who are going through this same kind of failure and that you're able to talk to them and able to say to them, I understand what this is all about. I've been there before. And maybe the reason why Peter is the one who's sitting there in this situation is because of things that will be coming up later. Strengthen your brothers is the best thing to do. It's just that he got scared, right? 
It's the best thing he can do because it's somehow we are involved in the process of making it better. We are standing against our failure. We are making a statement about that. Jesus gives him some kind of work to do, to go to do something against this failure, to take care of other people. And as long as you internalize failure and say, yeah, it's me, it's me, it's me, I'm terrible, 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 it's going to be terrible. But when you get off of that and say, it is me and I'm terrible, and boy, that guy needs some help. And I could go help him even when I'm still dealing and trying to struggle through my own guilt over the failure. Sometimes that's the easiest way to help somebody else is to do that. He gives him work to do. You know what it's like. You know it isn't fatal. They failed and they feel terrible about themselves. You failed and you feel terrible about yourself, but you survived. And so it's not the end. We just go on from here. We pick ourselves up and we say, we'll do better next time. And we decide we're going to make a difference. When you finally look at the event as it happens, recorded in Luke chapter 22... Verse 54 says, Then they seized him, and they led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. One of the few, Peter and John, who were following. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And the servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The account is just like Jesus said. A servant girl, aren't you one of them? No. Aren't you... From Galilee, you're a follower, right? But I think it's the time delay. So if it's an hour apart, you don't really connect this one with that one. If you'd asked me three times in a row, by the third time I might have gotten it. But you know, over three hours, I forget. And they are connected. Because he's been sitting by that fire because the trial's taken a while because there is great abuse being given to Jesus. And I think it's so interesting the way Luke records this. Jesus apparently is facing away at the trial as Peter's trying to watch and be aware of what's going on at the trial. And it says he turned and he looked at him. You ever gotten that evil eye from mom? I think Jesus's might be worse because it says, you know what you did. And I told you this was going to happen. It's got to be one of the hardest things. I told you this was going to happen. And now it's happened. And now you realize it. Now you know that you're guilty and you know that Jesus knows because it was exactly on cue, exactly as the rooster crowed, exactly as you were finishing your statement. Sometimes God's timing is just so incredible to convict us of our failure so that he can show us his glory. Well, Peter's distraught. He has to leave. He breaks out into tears. I think that's an important part to realize. In your failure, you do need to weep bitterly. That's part of what we had talked about before with about meeting Jesus in our sin. There is a time for this repentance to take place, for this time when we are so upset and so distraught and our repentance is definitely needed. But that's not the end of failure. And sometimes failure is bigger than just sin. 
Okay? Because I think Peter's obviously committing a sin here. He's saying he doesn't know him when he does. That's a lie. But, you know, is it really that bad? You just say, I don't know him. You just didn't want to admit that you knew somebody. I mean, that's not even one of the Ten Commandments, saying that you didn't know somebody. It's not even listed anywhere in there to say that you don't know somebody's a sin. How can that be a sin? How can that be something that is so terrible? Why is Peter so upset with all of this? Well, it's a failure that is much bigger than his sin. It's the breaking of Peter. It's a denial of who he is. It's a denial of what he's been doing for the last three years. It's a denial of himself and of what he believes. It's a denial of, of the friendship that he has with Jesus. It's one of those things that's hugely important because he staked his life on this relationship with Jesus and now he's just said, yeah, I don't even know him. There's a lot of phrases that I want to maybe share with you because this is not a Christian problem. It's a common problem that happens all over the place. One is this, those who try to do something and fail are infinitely better than those who, tr who try to do nothing and succeed. Just think about it. To be caught in a failure, to be at that point where where it didn't go right, it didn't go well, and I'm not trying to cheer you up about it, but it is better than just sitting there and saying, no, nah, I think I'll fail, I think I'll fail, I think i fail. Well, you definitely will, because you didn't even try anything. And I think maybe that's the worst part, is because we didn't even try anything. Failure sometimes is is bigger than just sin. It's bigger than where we are, and I think we need to recognize this. Thomas Edison was the one who invented light bulbs. It's the reason we're able to see in a building that has no windows anymore. Uh, but as he was trying to do that, this was one of the sayings that he said. He, he couldn't quite get it. It was taking him a long time. He says, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Well, that's a good way to look at it, isn't it? To be positive about it, I have discovered something important. It doesn't work. Well, then you do what? Then you go on to something else. And you try 10,001. I think that's an important concept for us to recognize that failure is not fatal unless you never get up and try again. It is so important with that to realize that that's what God wants. That's what it's all based on, is being able to get up and try again. A couple more. In 1902, a poetry editor for the Atlantic Monthly returned a stack of poems with this note. Our magazine has no room for your vigorous verse. The poet was Robert Frost. In 1905, the University of Bern turned down a doctoral dissertation as irrelevant and fanciful. The writer was Albert Einstein. 19, 1894, an English teacher noted on a teenager's report card a conspicuous lack of success. The student was Winston Churchill. Are you getting the pattern? Every great person has had great failure. Really? So what does it take to be a great person? Great failure. Because it means you've tried to do great things. And so just realize that's what it takes. And I think we see that throughout Scripture as well. Each one of those people did not quit they got back up and they did it again and they worked harder and they didn't believe when, um, when somebody else said, you're a failure. They said, no, I'm not. I just know a reason that it doesn't work. And they went on with life and they went on to live more. Well, let's go back to Peter for just a minute. In John 21, not only had they done what 
the denial, and he's already gone through that. Now they've given up on being disciples at all, and they go back to fishing. And they decide, we're just, you know, Jesus is gone, and he died, and he came back, and we saw him, and now we don't know what to do. So they go back to fishing. And failure upon failure, not only have they given up on being disciples, they're not even good fishermen. If you ever want to feel like a failure, just go fishing. That's one way to, for sure, well, at least when I go with you. If you go with Danny, I think you're more lucky. But uh, when I go with you, no, you're going to get the other experience. And Jesus so, shows up on the shore and he says, do you have any fish? Thanks. No, we don't. And it's a repeat of what they did at the beginning. Once you let down your net on the other side, we know that doesn't make any difference. Except for in this case, they know better. They do let down their net on the other side, and there's 153 large fish. Apparently no small. All of the fish are large. How does Jesus come back after Peter's failure? And even want to talk to him at all. I think there has to be the understanding that great friends will fail you. But great friends are the ones you can get past the failure and go on with to a better relationship. You see, as he talks to Peter, he pulls him aside. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he does it a third time and it begins to get Peter worried. And he's saying, well, you know that I love you. What are you and maybe it's because there's three times denial and now there's three times confession. He's giving him something to do. He's not saying, it's okay, we'll get over it, we'll get past it. No, there's something I want you to do. I want you to take care of those Christians. I want you to take care of those brothers in Christ. I want you to feed my sheep, tend my lambs, be there for them because they're going to be failures also. They're going to be the ones who can't recognize what they're doing or how they're supposed to do it. And I think the reason Peter is found in this situation and maybe the reason it is recorded so much about Peter and about his failure and about the fact that he denied Jesus. He sat right there with Jesus looking at him and said, I don't know that guy. Wow. It's because when Peter stands up on Pentecost, he says, I know what it's like when you crucified the Son of God. I know what that kind of failure must be like. Because you shouted, crucify him, crucify him. All I said is, I don't know him. But it's the same thing. We denied our own Savior. And so because Peter has been in the situation, he now spends the rest of his life strengthening other people. Do you love me more than these? There is a connection between failure and great work for God. So what happens in a church that isn't working? I want to suggest maybe they haven't realized their own failure. They have not come to grips with it. They've tried to hide it. They've tried to say, well, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Rather than saying, you know what I did last night? I denied that I even know Jesus. And maybe when we come to grips with our own failure, you realize there's something else that you do about it. One of the great quotes, it, this one has to be one of my favorite, comes to, from Winston Churchill. 
Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. There's just something about that that says, what? How can you do that? Because you know it's not over. You know it's not the end. If you refuse to admit the failure, then sometimes it just leads into arrogance. If you've never had any failures, then it leads into, well, I do everything right. Everything I do is perfect, at least all the stuff you know about, right? But I think sometimes when we realize our own failure, then we know we failed and we know better and we don't have any pretense of arrogance about it because we know that we're a failure. Now we're ready to listen to God and to do what God wants because our way didn't work. And we're ready to take care of people. We're ready to understand what that's all about. The two biggest people that we read about the most in the New Testament are Peter and Paul, and Paul does exactly the same thing. As you look at 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about Jesus who came back and appeared as a resurrected Savior to different groups of Peter, then different groups of people, then he says, He came to me. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see the pattern? I'm the least apostle. I am unworthy. I persecuted people. I physically injured people who were claiming Christ. That's a failure. It was in ignorance, it was before I knew any better, but you know what, they don't really think of it that way. It was me. By grace, I am what I am. And I think failure's there for that reason. Because if failure wasn't there, we would think we were good at it. Failure shows us that it's by grace that we do anything at all. God knows all about our failure. Sits there and watches it. Even when we are at our worst, God is not surprised. But in our failure, God finds a way to heal and to make us useful and to make us fruitful. I think there's a certain part of that trimming the vine, that the pruning process that has to do with how we deal with failure. Sometimes it's our mistakes, and we're able to see Jesus more clearly through mistakes than we are at any other time. And it allows us to work harder because we recognize that's what makes all the difference. One baseball player set a major league record for strikeouts, 1,316. And the same player set a record for five consecutive strikeouts in a World Series game. The holder of both records was Babe Ruth. If you focus on the failure, you don't ever know what greatness looks like. Because there's infinitely more things that go wrong with our life than the successes. But what makes a great life is the one success. It's the one great thing that happened. It's the one thing that you did. It's why I like to play golf, okay? When you play golf, you get to hit the ball as much as you want. I mean, 15, 20 shots to try and get to the hole, eight or nine to put it in. You can play all day long. But that's not really the goal. You know what keeps people coming back to play after 90 or 100 horrible shots? That one shot. 
the one that you hit right. And when you go and tell other people about it, you're going to tell about the one that you hit right. And it landed this far from the pen. Because we don't keep record of all the other stuff. And it's really the story of life, isn't it? It isn't about all the stuff you did that didn't work. We know 10,000 ways to live life that doesn't work. But boy, there's a few of those successes that keeps us going. It says this is really what it's all about. I think Adam's maybe the biggest failure of all, right? I mean, there's nobody else around but his wife, and then he listens to his wife, and he eats the fruit, and they get thrown out of the garden, and he looks at Cain and Abel and says, you guys can't go in there. Nobody ever for the rest of time ever will see that garden. That's got to be failure, isn't it? That, that really rests on you a lot. To realize that you have condemned all of mankind to never be able to see what was such a privilege for you. Until you realize, you know, without that, we have no need for Jesus Christ. We have no filling with the Holy Spirit. We have no grace. We have no forgiveness. We have no depth of the love of God. For us when we fail. And you realize we're better off. We're better off with the failure. And God knew that. And God planned it that way. And it's really what we're able to see. Second Corinthians chapter 5 is the last one I want to share with you. The response to that is therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Why? Because we've had a lot of failures. You need a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's God's plan. Failure recovery is our ministry. We don't go out as people who have it all together and say, yeah, we've never messed up at all. And we've covered it up so well, you'll never find it. We go out as the fact, you know what? We're, we're both failures. And I want to tell you how you can make yours better. Because I've had a couple of days that have just been incredible. Because the grace of God was there. The love of God was there. The worship to God was there. It's such an amazing thing to realize that a person who is such a failure finds Jesus in the middle of their failure. Where else do you want to find him? You won't find him in your success because that cross is about our failure. And we meet him there in our failure. God is reconciling the world to himself. Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. The passage I just read to you about becoming a new creation, that can happen this morning. You are that close to success in God. You are that close to getting rid of any failure that you've ever had in your life, not because it's taken away, but because it's forgiven, because it no longer matters, because Jesus died for it, because grace has been given for it, because it is so, so important that God has given us this ministry of failure evangelism. Isn't that what we do? We always thought of it as friendship evangelism. I think maybe it ought to be failure evangelism. Let's get all of us together and realize that God is so amazing in what he does. 
because part of your life is also that Satan has demanded. But I also want you to know that we're praying. So today, if you want to do something different to make something out of your failure, would you come while we stand and sing? I can't.